Who is really holding the keys to your wealth? It's July 1914, and tensions across Europe are escalating. Full-blown war is becoming more likely by the hour. Imagine you are part of a frustrated crowd waiting outside the doors of the Bank of England, trying to swap your banknotes back into the gold you had previously deposited. You see, once upon a time your banknotes were redeemable for an equal amount of gold. In 1914, just before the war, people were concerned that the dollar currencies and banknotes they held would lose their value as the government printed more money to fund the war. They were right. If you walked into your local bank today and demanded gold in return for your banknotes or balance, you'd probably end up in a mental asylum. But this was the original agreement. Nearly 100 years later, the Bank of England has still not fulfilled its original promise of allowing people to cash out their gold. We all live with and accept a monetary system that is backed by nothing. Interestingly, History is one big, dumb, repeating loop of government and central banks taking control of public purse strings and then screwing it up badly. This was happening long before the gold standard and long before the First World War. Abandoning the gold standard. Leading up to the war, the Bank of England had become the centre of the financial universe. It was the most powerful banking institution in the world. Depositors trusted the central bank and commercial banks. It made sense for them to store their gold with banks and then transact using banknotes and cheques. The promise was that the notes would always be redeemable for an equal and fixed amount of gold. This was the gold standard. But then the war happened. In November 1914, the British government issued a war bond. The government attempted to borrow money from the public. It aimed to raise hundreds of millions of dollars to fund military expenses. There is some evidence to suggest the bonds did not sell, which would indicate the public did not support war, were concerned about the repercussions of war, or both. So with a war to fight and no money, what to do? To fund its war efforts, the Bank of England was instructed to print magic money to lend to the government. To do this, they needed to abandon the gold standard by creating money no longer backed by gold. Eventually, the government issued an appeal to the public to hand over all their gold and take payment in notes and withdrew its promise to allow people to cash out their gold. This was the moment we threw ourselves in the slammer and handed over the keys to our wealth. Guiding a country through the world's first global conflict would have been a horrible job, no questions there. Some argue the government had little choice but to print money to fund the war. But whether or not you agree with the decision to abandon the gold standard and fund war, there's no ignoring the repercussions. Mass manipulation, two world wars, and multiple financial crises later, the Bank of England is yet to resume its promised redemption of gold. Instead, most of us go about using our financial system oblivious to the fact it was created to allow governments to fund war and respond to economic threats. Why do we use banks and fiat money? If you're like most people, you probably use and store money with a bank because you need to pay for stuff and you want somewhere safe to keep your money. Our current financial technology is an incredible innovation that allows us to do both of these things. You might hate banks, but would you revert to bartering with sheep to pay your monthly rent? I can pay a stranger on the other side of the world for something with a single click. Behind the scenes, a shared banking technology will square the transaction between our two banks. We've certainly come a long way. The caveat? To use this system, you must hand over the keys to your wealth. Because central banks and government control the purse strings, they are under immense pressure to make stupid knee-jerk decisions, like printing shit-tons of money, to keep everyone happy in the short term, while sacrificing long-term well-being. And that is exactly what has happened over and over again for most of modern recorded human history. We hand over the keys to our wealth, giving central banks and governments huge amounts of power and responsibility. Sooner or later, they misuse that power, and almost everyone gets screwed. For this reason, it's important to separate the true potential of cryptocurrencies, cryptography and blockchain technology from centralized platforms. The FTX fiasco FTX was a centralized online platform and marketplace allowing people to sign up and purchase cryptocurrencies like Ethereum and Bitcoin. The FTX slogan was the safe, regulated way to buy and sell Bitcoin and other digital assets. Centralized means there is a single point of control or middleman. When you transfer a friend $20 to pay them back for dinner, it feels like you're transacting directly. 
but you're actually transacting through an intermediary, and that intermediary has the ability to approve or deny your transfer. In the case of FTX, centralized means that rather than me buying and taking full ownership of my cryptocurrency, I am transferring my money to the platform, FTX, and then trusting that platform to make the purchase and hold the cryptocurrency on my behalf. So what happened with FTX? The owners of the centralized exchanges could have used customers' funds to directly purchase and store the cryptocurrency assets on the customer's behalf. But they didn't. Rather than store the funds safely, they used that money to fund all kinds of weird and wonderful things. Super Bowl commercials, bribing politicians, orgies in the Bahamas and gambling in risky investment strategies trying to make more money. We then watched in horror as one of the largest centralized digital currency exchanges in the world was exposed embezzling customer money. When customers came knocking to retrieve their money and crypto assets, FTX was broke. Billions of dollars of customers' money gone, bye-bye, insolvency. Does this sound familiar? Spot the difference. Unfortunately, centralized platforms like FTX get lumped in the crypto bucket. But FTX has more in common with a bank than it does with crypto technology. When you place your hard-earned wealth with your bank, your bank is not actually storing that money safely. They are taking it and using it somewhere else to earn more money. Banks have established rules and regulations, so you would hope your bank isn't using your money to fund orgies in the Bahamas. But the fact remains, your bank is in the business of making money. When you deposit your wealth at your bank, it is not being safely stored in an account, nor is it backed by anything real. Because we all subscribe to and use modern money with no backing, the central bank and government are able to use and manipulate the supply. In fact, they are under a lot of pressure to do so. The major difference between the central bank and FTX is the banking system, and fiat money has become so widely accepted that people don't question it. If the central bank and government misuse customer funds, they can just birth more magic money into existence to cover it up. Unlike FTX, they are yet to be held responsible for their crimes almost a hundred years later. Alas, if history has anything to teach us, it's that sooner or later the cracks in the plumbing start growing, and no amount of government intervention, manipulation or money printing can repair the leaks. History keeps teaching us the same lesson over and over again. So what's the solution? Think of our current financial technology as a live record of all transactions and accounts, a ledger. The ledger is updated when you transfer your friend $20 for dinner. The problem is the ledger in its current form is controlled by government and central banks. They are the only two players who can directly manipulate the ledger, and they do. Over the past 100 years, central banks and governments have used this control over the ledger to change the rules and print huge amounts of money, which has led to a lot of debt and the devaluing of currency. For the first time ever in modern financial history, we have the technology to replace the old system. We can pay for stuff and store our wealth without needing to hand over the keys. Blockchains can serve as a new type of ledger, but these ledgers are not controlled or owned by any single centralized entity. You can transfer $20 to your friend for dinner without having to go through a middleman. The transaction is overseen by computer code, cryptography and distributed operators who aren't able to manipulate the ledger. For all its complexities, it's really that simple. Admittedly, the user experience is currently abysmal and impractical for everyday use. But things are improving fast. It's not a stretch to imagine that within the coming years, the user experience of self-custody for digital assets will be far more seamless, appealing and profitable than the centralized alternatives.